Hello everyone, my name is Ekaterina Velamova and today I'm happy to present the UNIMORF project and the morphological inflection task. So this is the first part of the talk in which I will try to provide some motivation for the UNIMORF project. But to start with, uh, the ultimate goal of NLP technology is to bring it to as many languages as possible so we can perform machine translation between any languages and speech recognition and many other tasks. And in addition, we would like to use this technology to study languages and to document languages. Languages have uh, lots of in common and specifically human languages they are very different from other communication systems and Charles Hockett outlined essential properties of human languages such as displacement or the ability to refer to things in space and time and communicate about things that are not present at the moment. For instance, we can uh, create myths, we can uh, tell stories and so forth. Language is also productive. So we are able to create new and unique meanings of utterances from previously existing utterances and sounds. Among those properties, he also noted duality of patterning. Uh, so we can uh, create uh, meaningful words out of meaningless phonic segments or phonemes. And out of words, we can create sentences and larger units. And in addition, he also outlined other properties such as learnability. So a speaker of a language can learn another language. For instance, my native language is Russian, but I still can learn English, Chinese, or Hebrew. So on the other hand, uh, languages are very different. And I would like to uh, recall uh, the famous quote from uh, Roman Jacobson, who said that languages differ essentially in what they must convey, not in what they may convey. So, and I would like to provide you with some examples on how languages can use different instruments to express the same meanings. Uh, for instance, if you want to say we learn these new words in Japanese, uh, sorry, in Chinese, which is other Latin language, so. I need to put these words in a fixed order and the notion of the past tense and plurality will be expressed as special words. Uh, whereas in Russian, I would use morphology to express the past tense and plurality features. In addition, I would put the, uh, these new words in the accusative case to uh, uh, specify that this is the direct object of the sentence. So um, in Russian, so we would use agreement uh, to signify the relations between the words. So the order is more flexible. So if we continue toward this direction, um, so we end up in polysynthetic languages. Here is an example from West Greenlandic. Uh, where a uh, meaning of the whole sentence can be expressed within a single word. Uh, or uh, here is an example from uh, Kuvinku, a language from the north of Australia. So again, we see that uh, as the meaning of sentence, I cooked the wrong meat for them again, is expressed within the single word. And uh, this raises a question, what is the word in general? Uh, cross linguistically. And for that, uh, I would like to advise you to read this recent uh, article by John Mansfield on the notion of words across languages. So, and as we see, languages might differ in many ways. So, some exhibit rich grammatical case systems. For instance, neuralic languages might have from 12 to 24 grammatical cases. Some uh, mark possessiveness, 
and others might have complex verbal morphologies such as Ottoman Indian languages or even decline nouns for tense like in Figurani languages. So, of course, it raises the question what is a noun cross linguistically, typologically, or what is a verb? So, and I would like to discuss the following dimensions that are relevant to morphology. Uh, fusion, inflectional synthesis, and position of case affixes. So if you look at Wall's data, we see that uh, in terms of fusion, uh, languages uh, may uh, be isolating or concatenative, or they can also use tones. So and concatenative morphology is the most common system, uh, but non-linearity such as ablaut or tonal morphology can also present. Uh, in terms of isolated languages, we see them in the Sahel Belt in West Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific. Whereas in Mesoamerican languages, we might observe some tonal concatenative morphology. So if we move to the next uh, Wall Street, 22A, uh, so it uh, describes inflectional synthesis of the verb. So how many categories can be expressed on the verb? Uh, so we see that analytic expressions are common in Eurasia, and synthetic expressions are used to a high degree in the Americas. And finally, in terms of position of case affixes, we might have uh, suffixes, prefixes, infixes, or circumfixes. So, and suffixation is common for Eurasian and Australian languages, and to a lesser extent, it's uh, present in South American and New Guinean languages. Whereas prefixation is common for Mesoamerican languages and African languages spoken below the Sahara. So we see there's a, a great variety of these uh, languages and how they express those meanings. And uh, in parallel to that, there is a variety of those uh, descriptivist traditions. So if we um, try to recall the earliest ones, such as Panini, so it was uh, done for Sanskrit, right? And Panini introduced the system of Caracas that is nowadays can be uh, some, somewhat mapped to the grammatical case. So uh, Panini noted there are some regularities in the uh, uh, words. So, and he described this system. On the other hand, if you look at, uh, for instance, Russian morphology, so Russian linguists had formed their own tradition of uh, description of languages. And there's uh, uh, a famous Russian linguist, Andrei Zolesniak, who described Russian declension system. And we see uh, that uh, even within Russian, we have different approaches to the description of language. And for instance, in terms of the grammatical case number, uh, for Russian, we might observe there are works that identify six grammatical cases, where, and uh, the other works might identify up to 11 grammatical case systems in terms of uh, grammatical cases, sorry. So, and uh, nowadays, if you think about uh, the great source of like morphological information or maybe information about etymology, you would uh, recall sources such as dictionary. So dictionary provides description for inflectional mor morphology in the form of paradigms, derivational morphology, etymology, and possible translations. And here is an example for the declension uh, table for the Russian noun that stands for runner. So it has six grammatical cases and two grammatical numbers. And on the intersection, we observe the corresponding form. So this table is generated using a specific template that has certain arguments such as animacy and the stress pattern. So, and uh, if we look at this template, we can also extract declension classes if we like. And uh, crucially, if we now compare Russian edition of dictionary to English edition of dictionary for the same Russian language, 
we see that they are different. So they have different approaches to describe, uh, to describe Russian morphological uh, paradigms. So, and if you compare to other languages such as Hungarian, again, Hungarian might be influenced by their own tradition of this descript, uh, describing the languages. So their grammatical case names might be slightly different. So the general problem in dictionary is that it provides uh, somewhat inconsistent annotation across languages. And even within a language, if we look at different editions of dictionary, we might see substantial differences. So, and uh, finally, for each language, we might observe many uh, kind of language specific features. So it's very hard to uh, run any cross linguistic study or uh, create some like universal uh, annotation using just this source. So, and uh, to summarize, so we see that uh, the one idea is that languages have lots of in common, and specifically this uh, idea is expressed as part of this universal grammar approach. And the other idea is that languages are extremely different. They uh, are they are very, they're so different that even, for instance, instrumental case in Russian is not the same as the instrumental case in Polish, uh, given that even Russian and Polish are related languages. So this idea was expressed in the famous paper by Evans and Levinson, which is called the myth of language universals. Uh, so to quote them, diversity can be found at almost every level of linguistic organizations, organization. Languages rely greatly on phonological, morphological, semantic, and syntactic levels. So, and typology describes these limits of cross-linguistic variation. So, and in the recent paper by uh, Martin Hasselman introduced and contrasted these uh, approaches by um, uh, providing the description of descriptive categories and comparative concepts. So descriptive categories are specific to languages and comparative concepts can be used to compare the languages. And this idea was the basis for the unimorph uh, annotation schema. So unimorph provides a universal annotation for morphosyntactic features of languages. And uh, the morphosyntactic features in unimorph, they, uh, they are on the kind of medium uh, position, middle position between those um, descriptive categories and comparative concepts. So the union mark was introduced by John Silla Glassman and David Yarovsky in 2016. And at the roughly that time, so John uh, basically uh, sat in the library and started typological literature and tried to identify dimensions of meaning, such as tense, aspect, uh, mood, grammatical case, number, animacy that might be universal. So he identified 23 such dimensions. And for, such, uh, for each dimension, he also outlined possible features that are cross-linguistically observed, such as uh, past tense, uh, future tense, or animate, inanimate, and so forth. So at that time, there were 212 features, uh, which is not an exhaustive list. So the more languages we observe, the more likely we try to extend this list with new features. And the second idea behind the unimorph is that it takes this amorphous approach to morphology. So it's word-based approach, which comes from Anderson. So, and the initial data for the unimorph was actually extracted from English edition of dictionary. So we basically uh, parse this paradigm tables and then converted the features into the unimorph schema. So, and here is an example of the data entry or particular uh, declension paradigm for Russian uh, noun. So it stands for abajur. Uh, 
Uh, so we see that this um, there's a lemma and the form and the corresponding slot, such as noun, uh, genitive, so it's for the case, and uh, singular for the number. So, and uh, here is an example for the uh, declension paradigm for adjective. And here is an example for the paradigm for the verb. Again, so this, you might also notice that uh, some features are not present here. So if you're familiar with Russian, so Russian accusative case requires the knowledge of animacy. And it's not present here, but it's present uh, in adjective. So it's again, it's one of the problems that you might face when you work with dictionary. So animacy is not part of this uh, paradigm table in the dictionary. It's uh, provided outside of this paradigm. So it's one of the um, drawbacks of dictionary. And if you work with dictionary, you need to keep in mind this, that certain features are not specified in that table. So this is a very uh, brief introduction into the Unimorph. And in the next part, I will talk about how we use Unimorph to train morphological inflection systems, how well they learn those paradigms, and what errors do they make.